Uh, I got a message for you today, uh, and, and uh, I believe it's going to speak to you. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, we're going to start in verse 1. I'll read just a portion of scripture, and so we're going to talk about this. Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem as he prepared uh, for the crucifixion. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them. Them to me. If anyone says anything, do you say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away? That's a good excuse to use. You know, if you ever, had, if you ever need an excuse, just say the Lord needs them. It's like, honey, I bought a new car. The Lord needs it. It's just, um, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. And they asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This, this passage of scripture is the beginning of Pas- Passion Week, Holy Week, is when Jesus came into Jerusalem. Another portion of scripture, it says, Jesus had set his face towards Jerusalem. Jesus has made up his mind that he is going to die. Now I want you to know this. This is not a surprise to Jesus. Jesus already knows what's happening. Jesus was born not to live. Jesus was born to be killed. Jesus was born to give his life away. He, Jesus didn't have aspirations of being like a great carpenter although his dad was a good carpenter. Jesus didn't have aspirations of, 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 of creating a great business, making it to some type of list or some type of level of popularity. Jesus came with the intention of dying. He knew what his mission was. He knew what his plan with, was. And in this passage, Jesus is now coming into the place where he would be crucified. I heard somebody talking uh, this week on a podcast, and, and uh, they were saying that um, he, they were asking this older guy, like, what's one of the greatest things, or what, if you could answer, have an answer to any question, what would you ask? He said, would you want to know when, you want, when you're going to die? And he said, no, I would not want to know when I'm going to die. He said, I would want to know where I'm going to die. They said, well, oh, well, why would you want to know where you're going to die? He said, I'd never go there. <laughs> All right. G- Jesus... Jesus, when he came, he came to die. He knew what would happen in Jerusalem, yet he still came. He came on mission for a mission, on purpose for a purpose. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem knowing what was going to happen. I want you to know this is that when the people begin to celebrate, they would say, Hosanna. Hosanna means save us now. So as Jesus came into Jerusalem, this was right after he had done a phenomenal miracle. John, the book of John, his account tells us that the day before, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus is, Jesus is the man right now. It's Lazarus was dead, now he's alive, now Jesus is coming into the city, the people are pumped, the scene is set, here comes King Jesus, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, the people's chief concern, their, 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 their biggest mission was that Jesus would become king so that he could overthrow the Roman government. They were being oppressed by the Romans, and so the Jews were praying to God that Jesus would become king. They had no idea that Jesus was planning to die. They knew he was coming into the city, and their desire, their plan was to make him king. And so they exalted him, and they praised him, and they lift him up. But but Jesus was about to disappoint everybody. I I don't know if you've ever been disappointed before, specifically by God. I think I hear this more than any other thing is that people are upset with God, disappointed by God, disenchanted by God. And I want you to know you're not alone. If you've ever been upset at God and how he does things and how he works, you are not alone. Because these people that were shouting Hosanna, the Bible tells us five days later, were shouting crucified. 
The same people that said he is the king, they also said he must die. I, I don't know if you've ever been so disappointed with God that you feel cheated, but these people, I think, felt that way. I remember years ago, uh, I was playing in just kind of like a, it was, it was a big sporting event to me, but it was just like a backyard football game. But there was a lot of pride on the line. And um, I, I, have a, um, I have this side of me that Jesus is still working with me. It's a very competitive side. I like to win. I just, who, who wants to lose, right? So I, I like to win. And, and, and so I, I get a little judgy when it comes to picking teams you know, for these type of events. And so we were about to play some football, and, and uh, we came out and said, hey, Dustin, you're the captain for one team. You know, we're going to actually pick teams. And, um, and, and, and I, I know I shouldn't judge, but I was judging. <laughs> I looked at everybody. I'm looking. I'm, I didn't know everybody. My, my, my buddy, he had the luxury of knowing these guys. I came in cold, and I didn't know. And so I'm just looking. I'm watching how they walk. I'm watching how they talk. I'm, watching, I'm looking at what kind of shoes they have on. Because uh, church softball hack, if somebody shows up in jeans, hit the ball to them. Right. I'm just going to tell you. And if you're one of the jean short guys, you need to stop. You're giving yourself away. You are telling everybody you don't know how to play. Unless you're trying to trick everybody, because that would actually work really well. Because we always hit it to the jean short guys. Uh, I, I, I hate to admit it to you, but I was judging. And this one guy showed up. He rolled up. He's got everything. He's got all the gear. He's, got every, he's ready. He's jacked. He's like, it, look, it looks like the Rock's little brother. And I'm like, all right, this guy, I'm picking him. So I'm like, he told my buddy, I said, hey, I got first pick. All right, man, you, you told me I was captain. I got first. He's like, yeah, that's fine. And so right away, I'm pumped, and, and I picked this guy. And, and my buddy, like, kind of snickered when I picked him first pick. And I'm like, wait a second. And he walks over, and he's just like, he's a picture of athleticism. And he walks over, and I'm like, dude, I got this. I got this. And we started playing. And I hate to tell you, but he was the worst player on my team. He looked like he could play, but he could not. I'm going to tell you, I've never been more disappointed in my life. I'm like, bro, you are defrauding the world. You come out here with all your Adidas gear. You got the bag and the shoes. You're all jet. Why are you even in shape? Like, you should just let yourself go. You can't play. You are, you're telling everybody you're something that you're not. And so uh, my buddy's just laughing. He's like, I can't believe you picked him first. And so uh, it's my carnal nature. You know, I just, I'm judging by appearance. I want you to know this, that the people in our story were so disenchanted by what Jesus appeared as and then what happened that they changed their allegiance. This is what happens in the story. They are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. We are going to make him king. Five days later, they're in the courts of Pilate, and they are yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And you got to begin to ask yourself, why the switch? How in five days did your allegiance change? And I'd like to propose this to you, that when God disappoints us, it is easy for us to back out on him. When God doesn't operate in the way that we want him to operate, in the timeline that we want him to operate in, it is very easy for our yells to go from Hosanna to crucify. Anybody can say Hosanna when things are going well. Anybody can shout Hosanna when everything's coming together and the king is coming to town and we got this thing all locked down. But what, what happens when you hit a storm? What, what happens when he feels like God's late? Or worse yet, what happens when it feels like God's making a mistake? What happens when the thing that you were hoping for is not happening? What happens when the thing that you had faith for is not coming around? And this happened to the people because they wanted him to be king, but Jesus came on mission. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout! Daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious. That's how we want to picture our God. Righteous and victorious. But then it says lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's lowly. He's triumphant, yes, yet he's humble. See, the people, they were expecting Jesus to overthrow the Roman government. They're thinking, we're going to be your soldiers. We're with you. Put a crown on this Jesus. Make him king. And I've got news for you. You can't make Jesus king. He's already king. 
You can't crown someone that's already been crowned. Jesus didn't come to earth for a crown. Jesus didn't come to earth so that people would yell Hosanna and put a crown on his head. Jesus came to earth for a cross. His focus was never the crown. His focus was always the cross. Jesus' aim was never to be validated by men. It was to save the lives of men and women all across the world. Jesus never wanted to be known. He wanted to be useful. He didn't want to be popular. He wanted to be effective. So he came with one thing in mind, and it was the cross. I don't know if you've ever thought this before, but, but I think when they killed Jesus, we lost. Right? It's easy to think that God made the best of a good, out of a bad situation. Like, man, they don't like him. They're going to crucify him. But, but Jesus is going to be raised from the dead. No, this was the plan all along. This was God's plan all along that Jesus had to die. His blood had to be spilt. He had to be a sacrifice. Your Bible says this, that nobody takes his life, but he lays it down on his own accord. This says that, that as Jesus came into the city, the entire city was stirred. The city was stirred because the day before he'd raised someone from the dead. If you raised somebody from the dead, wherever you went, it'd be stirred too. Jesus came in and the entire city was stirred. But I'm going to tell you this. Jesus didn't come to stir the city. He came to save the world. Jesus didn't come just to get us pumped up. Jesus didn't come just to get us excited. Jesus didn't come just to get everybody to yell and shout or sing a song or dance a dance. Jesus came to save the world. I think that somehow along the way that we have lost the, the, this mission, that we have lost the understanding of that Jesus didn't come to make us happy. Although he wants you to be happy. Some of you are like, I'm out of here. <laughs> He wants you to be happy. Just his chief goal was not to make you happy. His chief goal was to make you alive. His chief goal was to give you salvation. His chief goal was to give you a way out. His chief goal was to give you freedom where there was not freedom, life where there was not life, hope where there was not hope, faith where there was not faith. This was his plan. And when Jesus came in the city and the city was stirred, I think we all get excited. Like, oh, he's stirring the city. You know what my concern in the church is? Is that we have a lot of stirring. We can stir people up. Let's stir up. Dustin's been yelling and screaming. Let's stir it up. The band is going, let's stir it up. The lights are going. It's stirred up. It's stir but, but, but that stirring fades by Monday afternoon. God wants more for us than just to be stirred. God wants us to be moved. God wants something to shift in our perspective, in our pursuit, in our mission. Bishop T.D. Jakes, he says, the sign of Christianity is not a crown. It's a cross. And this is the truth, is that when Jesus came to earth, it was not to get a crown. He already had a crown. In fact, he left his crown to pursue the cross. And when he came to earth, he came to embrace the cross. He came, it was not plan B for Jesus to be raised from the dead. It was plan A. Jesus came to die. God's mission was to send him, for him to be persecuted, for him to be crucified, for him to take the beating that belonged to me and to you, for him to take on his stripes, on his back, the stripes that belonged to me and to you. He, he took it all on himself. And that was plan A. Was God's plan to raise him from the dead. I think for many of us, it is easy to run after what God can give us. So we run after the, th this is why the people were yelling Hosanna is because they were running after what Jesus could do for them. Oh man, hey, hey, here's somebody. He raised somebody from the dead. Here comes Jesus. Yeah, Hosanna, save us now. Come on, God, save us now. And they were all happy as long as Jesus was riding into the city to save them. But their allegiance switched quickly from Hosanna to crucify when he didn't do what they wanted him to do in the timeline that they wanted him to do it. I'm going to tell you, on this, on this Christian, in this Christian walk, in this spiritual journey, you're going to have to be willing to let go of your timeline. You're going to have to be willing to let go of the way that you want things to happen. There is this word, it's a really scary, bad word in Christianity, it's called trust. And you're going to have to trust that God has a plan for you. I, I would venture to say if your life mimicked the life of Jesus, that you would think God had left you. But God never left Jesus. God never went down, took a detour. God never left him. God never said, oh no, I don't know what to do. Man, these people wanted to make you king. Now they want to crucify you. God was working in the background the entire time. Wouldn't God 
in his faithfulness, in his goodness, in his sovereignty, be working in the background of our lives as well? When we think he's dropped the ball, when we think he's gone, when we think he's absent, when he showed up as almighty God, but then he didn't deliver the way that we thought he would deliver, don't you think that God in his love for us is working in the background? That's why we have scriptures like he will complete that which concerneth you. That's why we have scriptures like God will work, turn everything that the enemy meant for evil and he will work it for your good. That's why we have verses that God is working in the midst of what we're walking through. If you run after a crown, you'll miss the cross. And if you miss the cross, you will miss the crown. If your aim is what everything God can do for you, you will miss the true meaning of life and the fulfillment that comes from him. Because this is going to be, a, it's going to be a, a little bit depressing for a second, but we're supposed to follow Jesus' example. And Jesus didn't come to live. He came to die. And the same is true for me and for you. If we're going to experience everything that God has for us, our aim cannot be to live. Our aim cannot be a crown. Our aim could not be a status, a certain net worth, a certain level of popularity, a certain level of influence, a certain amount of followers. A certain, if we're running after crowns, we will miss the cross. But the crown is a reward for those who embrace the cross. So when I decide I'm going to die to me, I'm going to die to my ambition, I'm going to die to what I want, I'm going to die to the way I want my life to happen and my life to work. If I can die to that, I can come alive to him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? He didn't actually, he wasn't actually crucified. He didn't actually die, but he says, I have been Crucified, And he talks about this all throughout the Gospels. He said, I die to myself. I die to the things that I want, the, things that, the way that I want to do them, the life that I want to live. Did, did you know, I mean, this is, this, is like, this is not like good church growth message that I'm preaching right now, but did you know that the message of the cross is a message for us to come and die? That the reason that Jesus came was on mission to save the world, but what God wants to do through me and you is to be his hands and his feet, which means I have to die to what I want and the life that I want, and we have too many people that are running after crowns and missing crosses. I want everything that God can do for me, but I don't want to give up what I want. I want everything that God can give me, but I don't want to give up my way of doing things. I want everything. I want the perks. I don't want to pay the price. I want every, I want all the blessings. I just don't want to like really commit. But the cross is the place of greatest commitment because it's the place where I sacrifice the thing that I want. And I, I can say like Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You, you want to have real joy? Then you have to stop chasing joy like the world chases joy. It just, just so you know, it's not working. Just so you know, all the tactics of the world, they ain't working. It's not, it, it, it's not happening. In fact, it's getting worse. And the more you try to preserve yourself, the more you try to preserve your space, the more you try to preserve your rights, the more unhappy you will become. That is why the Bible preaches the exact opposite of self-care, of spoil yourself and be about you and be about your business. It preaches the exact opposite because Jesus loves us too much to be absorbed in the crown. He says you have to embrace the cross and embracing the cross, the crown will find you. Happiness is a result of my life laid down. Joy is a result of living his plan. Fulfillment is a result of his purpose coming alive in my life. You can stir the city with a bold entrance, but to save the world, you need a sacrifice. Some people just satisfied with stirring things up. Man, you had a couple years where you stirred things up. People knew you. People knew about you. No, if we're going to change the world, we need, a, we need an entire church of people to say we're, gonna, we're willing to lay down our life. We're willing to serve the purpose of God. We're willing to give. It's not about a pastor having a great message. 
Not about a band having some great song. It is about the church of Jesus Christ that recognizes that we're in this together, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And it's not a pastor's job to lay down his life. It's our job to lay down our life, that the message of the gospel would extend, would continue to reach, and would continue to minister to people all around the world. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not come for people to crown him or to shout Hosanna. He came to serve humanity so that we would have an opportunity at true life and true joy. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came on mission, not so that he could be pronounced as king, but so he could embrace his cross so that you and I could have life. Romans chapter 5, I love this scripture, verse 6. It says, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God, listen to this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Now, i got to give this to you because this is, this is super important. One commentary gives us a picture with this scripture. And the picture is similar to the example I gave you at the beginning of the message. Is The picture is like God's picking teams. And he is sizing up the competition and he's picking teams. And you would think you would pick the most skilled, like I did, thought, the most ad- athletic looking, which I did, was not right. But this scripture says, while we were still powerless, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, while we were unable to save ourselves. The commentary gives us this picture, that there's all these amazing people in all their different walks of life, and then there's somebody over here crippled and broken, tossed away, look down on, and Jesus says, them. He, he didn't pick us at our best. He actually picked us at our worst. That's the grace of Jesus. Did you know if he picked you at your best, you would have pressure to always be the best, or else you could lose his favor. But because he picked us at our worst, then we can't lose what he gave. The, the grace of God is not earned, and because it's not earned, it cannot be lost. The love of God is not gained by our good behavior, and because it's not gained that way, it cannot be lost by bad behavior. That's the grace of Jesus. Some of you have been striving for God's pleasure and God's forgiveness and God's, God, God being happy with you or okay with you. God is because he chose you when you were at your worst. He chose you when you were cussing at him. He chose you when you were sinning. He chose you when you had your back turned to him. He chose you when you were crippled. He chose you when you were broken. He chose you when you were cast aside. He chose you when you were a nobody. He says, I, I, cho- I chose him then. Only you know that place. And if you think about it in your heart, you know there's a place that's like, eh, I wouldn't have picked myself. And at that point, he says, yep, I'm going to die for them. I'm, I'm picking them on my team. I'm choosing them. I'm selecting them. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing them on my team. I chose them now. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, he, he died for us. This whole week, as I'm preparing this message and praying for you today, it's, it's honestly, I've been heavy, not with sadness, but with the gravity of what Jesus did. We talk about the cross and the resurrection all year round, but there's something special about this time of year that Jesus is walking into the city, and the city is stirred, but being stirred is not enough. That they want to put a crown on him, but a crown is not enough. He came to serve, and he came to find a cross. And really, God's, God's really request from us is that we would find our cross, that we would find the place. The, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says for you to pick up your cross daily. So it's not that I actually die, it's that I choose every day to die to my own life, to die to what I want, and to pick up my cross daily 
and begin to follow after him. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 19, it says, Listen to the cry of my people. This is a time in history where they had turned and they had pursued idols, the people of God. It says, from my idol, from, or people from a land far away. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is their king no longer there? Why have they aroused my anger with their images, with their worthless foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Saved. We're not saved. This, this is what I think this is saying, is you can be stirred and not stay saved. I'm not even talking about just salvation. I'm just talking about engaging in a Christian life that is all about stirring and not understanding the true mission, which means that I'm a crown seeker, not a cross seeker. That I, I want the perks, I want the blessings, I want everything, but, 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 I, but I don't understand that it's about him, that everything that's good from this life comes as a result of me laying my life down. And when I can lay my life down for others, my life comes awake. I, I tell people this in counseling all the time, and, and uh, it's oftentimes not popular advice, but it's very effective. I tell people that are struggling with discouragement or depression, this is usually, I'll give them a, a, a project. I said, when you leave here, I want you to go out and I want you to buy something for someone, do something for someone, or serve someone. Well, Pastor, I'm going through, no, 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 no. I understand. I want you to shift it. I, I, I want you to give something to someone. I want you to go down, find some homeless people, and buy their dinner. I want you to buy someone's gas for them at the gas station. I want you to go encourage someone on social media. I want you to turn your eyes from you onto someone else. That's what the cross is. The, the, the cross is saying, I'll die to the things that I want so that I can serve someone else. But this is, this is the wild thing about God. The Bible says is that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we don't seek him for the reward but he's faithful to reward those who seek, which tells me this, that he is not trying, I'm not trying to seek a crown, I'm seeking the cross. But in seeking the cross, there is a crown. Years ago, I was um, at, a, at a youth camp, and uh, I was speaking at this youth camp, and, and uh, one of the, the girls, this is um, one of the girls from the high school basketball team, one star basketball player, and uh, she came, and um, everybody knew her in our small little city, and, and uh, she had quite the past. I mean, she'd done all kinds of crazy stuff, and, and uh, she was known, not in a good way, and uh, she had a really bad reputation, and she, for some reason, decided to come to our camp. And I remember she came in and she kind of stood in the back and we were worshiping and, and uh, everyone's going after God and all of those things and she felt so out of place. All she could think about was all of the terrible things that she's done, all the terrible things that people knew about her that were in that room and everyone's worshiping and, and she just felt so distant from God and she looked up on the stage and up on the stage was a giant cross. And on that cross... She's telling me the story. She said she started to see, like written in her mind's eye, all of the terrible things that she had done. And it wasn't good. It brought more shame. She saw how she had dissed God, how she had turned from him, how she'd done this and broken this and, and been there and been with him and been, and she just saw all of these things listed. And she said she started to cry, not from the presence of God, but from the shame of everything that she'd done. And she said she looked up again through her tears and she saw in her mind's eye blood coming down that cross and covering every single thing that was written until she couldn't see it anymore. And I remember it was a Saturday night and she, I could see her in the back weeping and she dropped to her knees and later she told me the story. She said, I've never seen something more beautiful than the blood of Jesus she didn't even know what the blood of Jesus was. She said, I saw that blood come down that cross and cover every one of my sins. God's plan for us, his purpose for us, is not to live in shame, not to strive to be known or to be okay with God. But when Jesus gave his life the blood of Jesus covered everything that we would do, everything that we have done, everything that we would do in the future. 
And that Romans 5 comes alive because while he could see all of it, it's not that he doesn't know, but while he could see all of it, he still chose us. In his grace, in his love, in his compassion. This is why your Bible says it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It is not a two by four over their head. It is not an angry God. It is not a God who is judging them. It is a God who loves them that says, I'll willingly go to the cross. I don't have to be a king that you have to please. I'm going to go to the cross so that I can be a servant, so I can provide the blood that covers your sin so that you can walk in freedom. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Palm Sunday is all about, is a man named Jesus who made up his mind, who set his focus, who set his gaze on Jerusalem and said, I'm not going to be crowned king. I am going there to find a cross. And on that cross, I am not looking for a city to be stirred. I'm looking for humanity to be saved. I'm so grateful for the cross. All week we're going to be talking about this, and you'll see it on social media and all this. And Easter Sunday, we're going to celebrate. We are going to celebrate. We're going to party on Easter Sunday that Jesus is alive. But I think it's just fitting this week to just think about what he saved us from. Sometimes remembrance can be a negative thing. Sometimes remembrance can be a powerful thing. You think about where you are, where you were without Jesus. And the way he found you and the way his grace reached to you. I'm going to tell you this. You can spend your whole life trying to find peace, trying to find the right balance, trying to find the right relationships, trying to find hope, trying to find fulfillment, and you will fail. Crown seekers go empty. Cross seekers find crowns. I'm going to tell you this. I don't want to run after everything that God has. I want to run after him. And when I run after him, I get everything that he has. I want you to know this. If your aim has been God's blessing, if your aim has been God's hand, if your aim has been this or that, I'm going to tell you just refocus yourself today and just focus on him. He loves you so much. One of my favorite things to tell people is that God is a God who sees you. Not just us. You, 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 you. He, he sees us. 